Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Alex Titus. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. People don't feel safe. That's not made up. There is a real feeling in our community that we've lost safety. And I think justice is also making it right. Like rethinking some of the assumptions that are made in our current system. It's well established we're the most incarcerated nation in the world. We're not the safest nation in the world. So why is that? What can we do to think about these differently? All right, folks, we have called Alex Titus back to the show uh, because we were talking today about one of his favorite subjects, criminal justice. Uh, this week, we have Multnomah County District Attorney Mike Schmidt on the podcast, a great guest. A uh, little bit about Mike. Uh, he's been the district attorney. He, he's in his first term as, as the district attorney. Before that, he uh, was the leader of the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission. He used to work as nonpartisan staff in the state legislature. He was an intern for DA Mike Shrunk, uh, previous Multnomah County District Attorney. He also did Teach for America, which we touch on in this podcast. Uh, we cover a lot of ground, Alex. We talk a little bit about his work over the last couple of years. We talk about how the different um, different DA, different types of DAs approach the work across the country. Alex, I thought you had some insightful commentary about how it's not really a progressive versus conservative thing. It's a lot more complicated than that. I found that really interesting. Um, we talk about the people for Portland and Betsy Johnson critique of Mike Schmidt, and he gives what I thought was a, a compelling response to some of the claims like fewer prosecutions, which don't actually share the full picture of what's happening uh, in the criminal justice system. And then we talk about 2024 and he's got a couple, he's got one declared candidate. And um, I think people are expecting a, a hotly contested race. Um, Alex, any, any comments or things to look for in the episode before we dive into the interview? Yeah, the thing that I will probably go back and listen to again is uh, he goes through some of the different funding mechanisms of the piece of the different pieces of the criminal justice uh, system. Uh, very interesting and very complex and confusing. So uh, probably listen to that once, rewind it, listen to it again. But I thought that was a uh, particularly interesting point in terms of how some of these issues get lumped in together when it's much really like much more like there's actually specific lines. Uh, that, you know, judges might handle compared to the prosecutor, compared to the public defendants, where the funds come from, et cetera. So I thought that was particularly interesting, uh, even if that was a little bit of a nerdier part of the episode. So no, uh, I agree. Very, I thought that unique. was super helpful for my understanding. And I should mention, we also talk about the public defender shortage, uh, which he gives his perspective as a prosecutor who's been trying to draw attention to this for a long time. Uh, so Alex, anything else? No, I think that's it. Enjoy the episode, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Oregon law imposes several ethical obligations on state and local public officials. State law also regulates and requires reporting by lobbyists. Harang Long PC's lawyers work with public officials and lobbyists who need advice on how to comply with government ethics rules. We also represent clients before the Oregon Government Ethics Commission when they are accused of violating those rules. Our deep experience with government ethics helps us evaluate issues efficiently and offer practical advice in what can often be contentious and politically charged circumstances. To learn more about Harang Long's government ethics practice, go to harang.com. That's H-A-R-R-A-N-G.com. All right, District Attorney Mike Schmidt, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks, Alex. So uh, before we get into the hot topics of the day, uh, your personal and professional background, I found pretty interesting. Um, let's first start with Teach for America. So you did Teach for America. Where were you um, uh, stationed, for lack of a better word? Yeah, I was sent to what they call in TFA, the GNO, which is the greater New Orleans area. But I was in the city of New Orleans. OK. Uh, and how long ago was that? I was there from 2003 to 2005, uh, which uh, was right before Hurricane Katrina came and uh, wiped out the city. Wow. 
So I've, I've had several friends who did TFA and people have had varying degrees of positive experiences, but all seem to agree that it was transformative for them. I'm curious if you think it was like impactful in who you are today as an elected leader, uh, public official, like what, what were the, the lessons or the key, key moments from that experience that impacted you? Yeah, uh, it was absolutely, it was hugely impactful to me. Um, it was an amazing experience. You know, I, I remember driving down to New Orleans uh, from New York, which is where I grew up and where I went to college. Um, and I remember driving along the way and, and meeting people at gas stations and they'd see my New York plates as I got into the Southern States and they'd say, hey, you know, chat, where are you headed? I'd say, oh, I'm going to New Orleans. And they'd say, oh, hope you brought a vest, you know, hope you are ready for that. Um, and so I really didn't know what to expect uh, going what did that, down to the city. What, what did the, what did the vest mean? Like, like bulletproof vest? Like, like bulletproof vest, you know, like wow. the, the reputation of the city of New Orleans for violence and gun crime in 2003. Um, you know, that was, that was kind of the reputation that I think a lot of people had. Hmm. Uh, so driving down there, you know, I really didn't, I didn't have any, uh, family or relations there. So I didn't really know what to expect. Uh, but I got down there and started teaching and I loved it. Uh, I loved the community. I love the culture. I love the city, the food, the music. Uh, New Orleans is an incredible place. Uh, the people are incredible. They're nice. They're welcoming, um, you know, Southern hospitality mixed with that kind of Creole Catholic, uh, you know, different religions going there. Um, it's really an incredible spot. And, and, being a high school teacher, I taught ninth and 10th graders hmm. uh, um, at the aviation and automotive signature school uh, in New Orleans, and uh, I taught them civics. So my these are kids who opted into this school because they had some interest in uh, either aviation or automotive issues. So as a kind of history civics teacher, I'd bring in things like the Industrial Revolution, Henry Ford, Amelia Earhart, you know, that kind of Dick, you know, put my teaching towards things that they were interested in. Mm -hmm. um, but like most things and most things in life, and probably a lot of teachers say it's cliche, but it's true. Uh, I am positive that I learned more uh, from them than they learned from me. Uh, so for me, you know, I was uh, coming down from, from upstate New York, from Vassar College, recent grad, uh, obviously I am a straight white male and I go down and I'm teaching a class of young, uh, black kids. And, you know, the way I grew up, my experiences, uh, were not at all like what their experiences were in so many ways. And I remember, you know, one time there was a, um, a shooting adjacent to our school campus, uh, not on the campus, but it got us all locked down uh, for a little while while police were called and things were to get sorted out. And I remember having conversations with my kids and they, I said, you know, how many of you have uh, know somebody who's been shot um, or has been a victim of gun violence? And like every hand in the classroom went up, um, you know, compared to where I grew up in my small town in upstate New York, uh, I don't think anybody would have raised their hand or, or maybe one person or something. You know, these kids were living with a level of trauma and violence um, that, you know, I really couldn't fathom. Uh, I remember asking them, how many of you are going to go to college? And almost no hand went up. Uh, and I remember the one or two kids raised their hand and I just, I couldn't believe it. I said, well, what, what do you mean you're not going to go to college? And one of the kids told me, they said, well, if I'm only going to live to be 22 or 23, why would I go to college? Um, so they were just dealing with things and issues in life and, and having to be adults, um, a lot sooner than I was, um, you know, when I was similarly in their situation, it really had a big impact on me. And I think led me to where I am today. Hmm. So, so fast forwarding in your career, when I first became aware of who you were, you were working as nonpartisan staff in the state legislature, um, I'm also curious what that experience was like and if that uh, has contributed to your philosophy as a DA or informed how you approach the sort of elected official side, which is very different, obviously, than the nonpartisan staff. Um, so I'm curious your reflections on that. Yeah, I got to work for the uh, late, great Bill Taylor. 
Uh, may he rest in peace. We celebrated uh, Bill's life uh, earlier this year at a memorial service up in Washington. Uh, he was an incredible mentor. Um, he was, and, and many people, of course, around the Capitol know Bill uh, or knew Bill, and his voluminous knowledge of, you know, the history of not only our country, I mean, you know, Bill is well known for uh, his work with Speaker Tip O'Neill, you know, uh, amazing political history that he had in his own right. But then, of course, coming into Oregon, coming into the legislature, um, I remember any time there was any bill, you know, uh, some member would come in t- uh, to us as staff and say, hey, I want to do something like this, a bill that focuses on this or that around criminal justice, typically. Uh, and Bill would say, oh, I remember uh, we tried that in 88. And boy, that was a massive failure. And let me go to my file cabinet. And he'd like, you know, pull out some original uh, papers from some committee hearing that, that he was aware of. Uh, so it just an incredible institutional knowledge. Um, my big things for me, formative, I mean, Bill was a mentor to me and so many other people. I think the things that I take uh, from that, um, he was very he was very interested in our well-being and my well-being. I remember Bill walking into my office and insisting that I take a nap in the middle of the day. Uh, I've never had a boss hand me an Afghan and uh, point me to the couch and say, you need to go. I'm going to shut this door. We're going to turn the lights off. You're going to take a nap. Uh, that's never happened to me before or since. Um, Did you look guess, really uh, did you look really tired or was there something going on? What's the story? There? No, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I looked really tired. I, it's possible that I did. I felt fine. I was like, <laughs> this is strange. Uh, but you know, I, he was, he was that kind of guy. He was like, you want to make sure. And you all know how session goes, right? There are some days that you can really be grinding. Uh, when I was committee staff, you know, our chair was uh, Jeff Barker was chair of the house yeah. uh, judiciary committee. Uh, and Wayne Krieger and Andy Olson were yeah. on that uh, committee and they liked to get early, uh, get after it early in the morning. So okay. I'm driving from Portland. Right. And, but they want to have their first meeting of the day at like six 30 in the morning. <laughs> and so, cause these guys, you know, these guys are like, you know, Andy Olson, he's an old state trooper, you know, Wayne Krieger, kind of similar background, same with Jeff Barker. Um, so these guys are cops. They're like getting in there. They got their coffee. They got their donuts. They want to get after it early <laughs> in the morning. And so I, you know, to me, right. Driving from Portland, that means I'm up at five to get on the road by five thirty. So maybe that's what Bill saw is that, you know, my days were long sometimes, but I appreciated his caring about my well Um, you know, the other moment that sticks to me, sticks out to me about Bill. And we, and a lot of us have Bill Taylor stories, uh, was I remember one time that, you know, I was in a, in a staffing some work group or something with Bill and, uh, you know, the conversation was live, lively and, and I didn't say too much, uh, you know, in that room. And so we're walking out and I think we were walking probably to the speaker's office, you know, to, to go update the speaker on uh, what's going on. And uh, Bill just says, hey, you know, you didn't say too much in that, in that committee or in that work group. Uh, what were you thinking? And I just, you know, I, I kind of made some kind of shruggy comment about myself, a little self-effacing, like, uh, you know what they say, if you don't have anything smart to say, you know, keep your mouth shut and, and you know, that way people don't know. And uh, he just stopped. And I remember this so like, you know, there's moments in your life where you can see, you can visualize it. And I can see underneath my feet when Bill turned on me and stopped, I can see the, the carpet on the house, uh, you know, on the house side of the chamber under my feet. And he just stops and says, you know, don't ever say that about yourself. Don't ever think that, uh, you have a lot to contribute. You're a very smart guy. Uh, and you know, you, you belong here. And, you know, it, it just was a moment that stuck with me of, of somebody looking out, reaching out to me, a mentor who wanted to help build up my self-confidence, um, in a situation. And, uh, you know, it was a small interaction for Bill, but a big one for me. I have a very similar experience that I had with Val Hoyle where like I was a young LA, she asked me my opinion in a staff meeting and I would like gave a non-answer because I was like, didn't want to seem stupid. And she pulled me aside afterwards and like maybe less gently than uh, than Bill did to you. But she was like, you got to say what you think. That's how the only way you're going to be successful. So that's really cool. Uh, Yeah. Alex, you're next. I don't think she ever asked you to take a nap though, Ben. So, yeah. No, she did, <laughs> she did not. I know Val. I don't know. <laughs> just, just like that piece. But 
uh, but so a district attorney, I did want to ask, I, I actually Googled before this, what the definition of a district attorney is. And the, <laughs> uh, the definition was, uh, I guess, not as eloquent as I might have put it. I think it's someone who is in charge of criminal proceedings. And I was like, ah, oh, that doesn't sound very interesting. Of course, the job is interesting, the descriptor not. Uh, but I'd imagine just based on, you know, of course, being a district attorney, your past experience on the Criminal Justice Reform Commission, that uh, I guess to summarize, I would say your job and maybe a few words is to is to get justice. Uh, and I'm kind of just curious of how do, how do you define justice? Because I imagine it's something you, uh, of course, thought a lot about before you, you know, decided to pursue this job, but also something that you think about a lot during your day to day. Yeah, that's a great question, right? What is justice? Um, that's something philosophers have debated for, for centuries. Uh, but it's great. And you're right. You're exactly right. What does it mean? It is something that we think about all the time. Uh, you know, it's in our mission statement. It's in our values to seek justice for victims, uh, to seek justice uh, in the criminal justice system. You know, what do I think about it as? You know, one of the first things that I did when I became district attorney was to form a justice integrity unit. Um, and the whole point of that unit was really to kind of think holistically about what does justice mean? And, you know, for victims, I think a lot of it is accountability. Um, you know, I talk to a lot of victims of crime and, you know, people are all over the spectrum. People are as diverse in their opinions as there are people. Um, you know, some people I think would define accountability um, as, you know, I want to see uh, uh, some sort of a punishment, you know, maybe that's incarceration, depending on what the type of crime is. A lot of people that I talk to, um, they want to see accountability, but they want to see people set up to never do this again. Um, I think one of the incredible people, or one of the incredible things about human beings is um, their capacity for empathy and not empathy, even necessarily towards uh, the person who may have harmed them, but empathy towards everybody and their concern immediately is I was just hurt and I don't want ever anyone to ever be hurt like I was just hurt. So, you know, when I think about justice and justice for victims, we speak to victims. We, we want to know what they think uh, that they want because it's something different for everybody. And then more broadly, justice in the system uh, and with my justice integrity unit, I think it means that we get it right, um, that we do our best to get things right. And one of the things that our justice integrity unit handles and works on is wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. um, and we've uncovered a number of wrongful convictions this year. And in fact, we just got some legislation uh, passed that I expect that our governor will be signing soon, uh, fixing um, an issue between the Department of Corrections and the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, on um, communicating information about when licenses are suspended and felony suspended and what that looks like. Um, and for, you know, probably we think over a decade or so people were being arrested uh, and sometimes prosecuted and sometimes convicted wrongfully uh, for felony suspensions where there weren't any. You know, one of my deputy DAs uncovered that. And as soon as she did, she brought it to our attention and we started polling cases and finding uh, as fast as we could. We had to go through 3000 cases, over 3000 cases. Um, and we let the other district attorneys around the state know about this issue. Um, Columbia County District Attorney had a man that they sent to prison uh, for this crime wrongfully. He immediately petitioned the court to bring him back uh, so that he could be released because it was a wrongful conviction. Uh, to me, that's justice also is getting it right and, and having integrity about understanding we're all human beings. Mistakes are made. And in this situation, this DMV DOC thing, it, it truly is a it was a system mistake that was happening. I don't think there was any malice or, or anything of that nature, but we were getting it wrong. Um, and so we need to make it right. And I think justice is also making it right. Thank you for that. I know that's a, a really easy question. So uh. <laughs> yeah, that's a simple one. <laughs> it was a really simple one. Uh, and so uh, a district attorney, I did want to ask you, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know exactly what I would say the year that this started, but there's been, uh, of course, in Oregon, but then as well as across the country, uh, a rise in what I think some would call more progressive prosecutors. Now, I actually don't think that's a correct term uh, because there's actually a lot of people 
who I think many would associate on the right, uh, who I actually think agree with a lot of the things that you know someone like yourself is doing. The Koch Network has invested probably tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars at this point in criminal justice reform efforts. The Texas Public Policy Foundation has right on crime. Of course, there was a lot of Republicans who supported things like the First Step Act. So I, uh, I don't really think that the progressive versus kind of law and order prosecutor framing necessarily makes sense because I think it's uh, there's there's a, there's a decent number of folks kind of on both sides, right? I mean, we'll uh, talk about your uh, potential 2024 race as well, right? But I know that it's of course a, another Democrat who has declared against you. Uh, but could you just kind of give us? Uh, maybe a brief background on kind of who are these, obviously, I think you'd consider yourself one of them, these reform prosecutors. And then uh, what does that kind of look like, I guess, in difference of practice versus someone who someone may call a more traditional or law and order prosecutor? Yeah. Well, Alex, I think you're exactly right. Uh, I, I don't like the, you know, people do the tough on crime, soft on crime or tough on crime, progressive framing of the issues. And I, I don't think that that captures accurately. Um, it, 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 it kind of brings it down to is oversimplifies things. I've, uh, when I was working at the criminal justice commission, you know, I worked with Republicans and the state Jackie winners. And I, uh, you know, got to go on trips together down to, um, uh, to Angola in Louisiana. We visited and toured that prison. We went to Norway together. Uh, and there was very much a sense, Andy Olson, again, uh, Wayne Krieger, I mean, the judiciary folks that I worked with that were Republicans, uh, they talked a lot about these things and they thought very thoughtfully about things that other people might label as, oh, that's a progressive thing or not. Um, they just, they use different language a lot of times is my experience, you know, with uh, Representative Andy Olson or, or Krieger, um, you know, we would talk a lot about um, forgiveness. Um, you know, I think a lot of more uh, conservative folks come to things maybe with a religious lens to why they get there. Um, they can also come to it from a, a fiscal conservative lens. Um, we know that interventions like prison is incredibly costly. Uh, and we also know that the recidivism rate for people coming out of prison is 50 or 60 percent. So it's like, would you buy a, a plane ticket on an airline that crashes 50 to 60% of the time? Like, no, you wouldn't. So it's incredibly costly and it's not always the most effective option. Uh, so I see, you know, when I talk to a lot of uh, Republican folks, that was one of the things that I think they, they can come at it from that way. Of course, the more liberal or progressive, you hear a lot more language around root causes and how do we get at the underlying issues and address those issues. Um, so, but I think you're exactly right. It, you might get there for different ways or in different language, but this is not necessarily even a, a, a left or right issue. It feels like it is honestly more today uh, than it did four years ago or, or six years ago. I mean, I do now think that crime is back to being a political issue, but there was a good time where I felt like we could just have conversations about what works. Uh, and in fact, uh, we went to, um, when I was at the Criminal Justice Commission, we put on a conference uh, that was titled, What Works? And, and that's what it was about. Um, your question about when did these things get started? I think that there are some major, uh, you know, folks that people would point to as maybe the first of the so-called progressive prosecutors, Kim Fox in Chicago, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia, are a couple of the big names that I think people point to as uh, some of the first people. But I'll tell you, you know, I got to know Dan Satterberg out of Seattle, King County, and he had been the DA before, you know, either of them either ran, I even ran. Uh, and he certainly would have considered himself one of the progressive uh, prosecutors. Um, the philosophy to me that I think um, unites the group of people that kind of think in these ways and have been labeled that way um, is, is kind of thinking th like rethinking some of the assumptions that are made in our current system. You know, there's, it's well established. We're the most incarcerated nation in the world. We're not the safest nation in the world. So why is that? What can we do to, to think about these differently? When I talk to my fellow prosecutors around the country, they're, they're trying to get at, you know, what does the research say? What does the data say? And, and quite frankly, it, it is the same things that I hear from right on crime. You know, I follow Mark Levin, 
uh, on on social medias. And and I know so this isn't unique to them, but it is something that I think uh, we think about and talk about a lot. Is you know what does the research say? Will this work? Will this keep our community safe? I think we're also uh, frequently thinking about um, things more holistically. Uh, you know, prosecutors, we have a very distinct lane and a very distinct job to do, but we're at the tail end of a horrible thing usually happening. I mean, when we get called, the crime has happened, right? And so I think a lot of us also think a lot about how do we get upstream? What are the investments that can be made in other systems and maybe we can take some things out of the criminal system uh, and, and rely on other systems like the health system, the educational system. How can we bolster those things so that we can hopefully get ahead of uh, even ever having to prosecute a crime in the first place? So um, that is really interesting and really useful. And so the way that that shows up in Multnomah County and in the broader Portland area is the people who are on the other side of the equation as you are, the people who disagree with your approach, frame things using very particular language. I'll read a couple of examples and then I'd like to hear like how, A, what are they getting wrong? Because I think, I think I've heard you talk about or seen you write things like with data that sort of disproves some of their assumptions. Um, but on a broader level, like how do, you, how do you respond to the critique that these people hold? So first, classic place to start. Let's start with the Betsy Johnson op-ed. Uh, I'll take an excerpt from her recent op-ed. I think this was from a couple of weeks ago in the Oregonian. She says, there are too many, pe too many dangerous people on the streets who need to be arrested, prosecuted, and in jail. Things are not safe. We need to replace local prosecutors who won't prosecute with those who will hold criminals accountable. I think everyone sort of read that as a dig at you. Um, and then of course, there's people for Portland, which people for Portland and Betsy Johnson, I think come from the, the same lane <laughs> of politics. And they put up this gigantic billboard that says record crime, fewer prosecutions, empty jail beds with a picture of you. So I'm sure you see and hear these kinds of things all the time. How do you respond to that type of critique? Yeah, uh, I would say not only do they come from the same lane, uh, those folks were working together uh, on a gubernatorial sure. campaign. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, so that's right. That's right. The folks running people for Portland are the ones who ran her failed gubernatorial campaign. So there's a very uh, tight tie and through line between those two things. Uh, but what they're tapping into is real. Uh, they are tapping into something that's real. People don't feel safe. That's not made up. That's not fictional. Um, there is a real feeling in our community that um, that we've lost safety. And, and some of that's borne out um, in, in Portland, in Multnomah County, across our state uh, and across our country. We've seen gun violence uh, increase mm -hmm. um, in Multnomah County, in Portland. We've seen homicides over the last three years increase a lot. Now, we look like maybe we'll be on track to see a slight decrease this year, but not get us back to where we were a few years ago. Um, there are also, you know, there are some very real challenges. And I think, but one of the biggest challenges is uh, the perception challenge that people don't feel safe. And, and folks like, uh, you know, Betsy Johnson and the people for Portland, that is what they're tapping into. So, you know, I think first and foremost, all of us have to acknowledge that that's real. It's not fake. It's not made up. Uh, people don't feel safe. So how can we help reestablish safety and the feeling of safety, safety which is important? Um, for me, you know, I think it is trying to get the message and, and kind of cut through some of the misinformation. You talked about some of the bullet points on the billboards uh, and some of the things that Betsy Johnson said, uh, prosecutors who prosecute. We prosecute. Uh, we prosecute every day. Um, if you compare my uh, issuance rate to my predecessor's issuance rate, um, it's higher in almost every category. What's an so, issuance rate, Mike? Yeah, great. Thanks, Ben. So, so this is really important. People say criminal justice system, and it's kind of just used kind of flippantly. Oh, criminal justice system. And, and I think when people think about that, they, they might think of one face, maybe the police, maybe they think of the DA, um, but they say, oh, criminal justice system. But it is truly a system. It starts from the person who picks up the phone straight to our emergency response center, right? And in Multnomah County, BOEC is in charge of our 911 center. That's our first uh, intercept point a lot of the times. Then it's dispatch to the police officer. 
who is then having to respond. Then the police officer shows up and they have to figure out what's going on uh, and, and try to make the best of the situation and see what they can do to help. If the police officer believes a crime was committed, then they're gathering evidence, they're taking witness statements, they're then going to put together, if they make an arrest, a case to be sent to my office for lawyers to review it to see if legally we can prove a case. And before they do that, they're taking somebody to the jail. The jail is making a release decision. Then they're going to go in front of a judge. A judge makes a release decision. So there's a continuum of actors uh, and roles and responsibilities that go into how every one of these things go. So issuing is of the cases the police officers send to my office. So they make an arrest and they send us evidence. What percentage of the cases do my attorneys decide to charge? Um, and so when I say when you look at my office, our issuance rate is higher than my predecessors across most of the crime categories. That means when the police are sending us cases, when they make an arrest, they're sending us cases, a higher percentage of those cases end up being prosecuted than were, uh, you know, just even a few years ago. Um, so that's, that's you know, some of them. So what is the what do they mean by fewer prosecutions? Do you, do you know what they're talking about? Or are they just in, do you believe they're just intentionally sort of throwing things out there that align with the uh, narrative? So what is it? The Washington Post that puts like Pinocchio scores next to, <laughs> yeah. to claims, things like that. Um, it's, it's misleading. Uh, okay. it's, it is accurate in a sense, but it's misleading. So me as the prosecutor, um, I kind of just described what it takes for us to get to a case, right? If the police don't make an arrest, I'll never see the case. So I can only issue the number of cases that are sent to me to review from police agencies, right? Mm -hmm. So what they are really seizing upon is in the city of Portland, uh, the, the Portland police have been stretched in over the past few years. Um, and especially with an uptick in violent crime where they're going from, you know, a, a shooting or homicide, things that really take a lot of resources for them to respond to. We've seen a massive decrease in the number of misdemeanor cases referred to my office. Interesting. So if you were just to do a straight count, how many cases did Multnomah County District Attorney's Office issue in 2019? And just count the numbers, all the misdemeanors, all the felonies, add them up and compare that to 2022. You'll see that we issued less cases oh, total. Oh, I see. But the area where there are less cases are misdemeanors. And the reason we're seeing less misdemeanors being issued, even though our percentage is similar in the rate that we are issuing them, is because the, the Portland police, which is our biggest law enforcement agency in Multnomah County, we have several, but they're our largest, is sending us substantially less cases. In fact, they're sending us about 35% of the cases that they used to send to us pre-pandemic in misdemeanors. So if you were to, if you were to let that metric guide your decision-making, oh, I need the same prosecutions as the same number of prosecutings as the previous, you would have to be prosecuting cases that you don't have enough evidence to, to think you could win the case that like aren't you. It's a poor metric to measure what a DA should be doing is basically what you're saying. I, I could not physically hit the number because I only get to review cases that the police send to our agency. Right. So even let's say that we issued a hundred percent of everything that they make an arrest, we issue the case, whether or not the victim wants to participate, whether or not we have witnesses or evidence, we did a hundred percent. We would not hit the number we hit in 2019 <laughs> because the volume is not coming into the agency. And of course, as we're bringing cases, you know, we're asking uh, the courts to hold people sometimes uh, before their case is heard. Uh, so we make recommendations to the judges about whether or not somebody should be held in custody pre-trial is what you call it, but before their case goes to trial. Um, and then ultimately, when the case is resolved, we are making recommendations to the judge about what should happen in the sentence. But it's the jail and the sheriff uh, runs the jail in, in Multnomah County. And I think that's pretty consistent across all 36 counties of Oregon. The sheriff runs the jail. There is, I think, one or two city jails, but for the most part, the sheriffs are running the jails. So they are working with the courts right at the front door to see who gets held and who gets released. And then uh, if you are held, 
uh, then it's up to a judge to say whether or not you should remain in custody. Um, and this is one of the things that I see uh, on you know social media all the time. Mike Schmidt released this person. Uh, well, the DA, any DA in this state, not just Mike Schmidt, uh, we don't have the jail keys. We don't make those decisions. And in fact, most people are released from jail before my office ever even receives the police report. Because that decision is being made right at the front end before we even get to review the evidence. So the role that a prosecutor plays in any county is when we are in front of a judge and a judge is making a decision on whether or not somebody should be held or released. Uh, that's where we are advocating to the court for our position. The defense attorney will be advocating for their position and the judge ultimately decides who is and who is not held in jail. Okay, so that's this is all super helpful, and I hope helpful as helpful to listeners as to me. So DA is pos positioned sort of in the middle of this criminal justice system. Um, you are your work is dependent upon the flow in from law enforcement, uh, and you're flowing out to um, county jails. So maybe a harder question here that I'm curious about is: Does that mean we need? to hire more police officers who can make more arrests if what you're, because you agree, people don't feel safe. Safety is a real problem, increase in, in violent crime. Does that mean like there's a missing piece at the beginning of the system where we don't have enough law enforcement officers to actually um, keep the community safe? So every community needs that, to assess and answer this question for themselves. Um, and I think that was one of the things that I thought was harmful about the, the defund movement is it, it wasn't nuanced. It wasn't looking at each police station and each community and trying to figure out what the right strength for the police officer force should be in their community. So every community needs to answer this for itself. Uh, my opinion on, I'll talk about the Portland police, because that's, again, the largest agency in Multnomah County that they do need more police officers. I absolutely do believe that. And I think especially what I'm seeing is uh, officers and detectives uh, who can do that kind of the follow-up work, the detective work, that's where I see um, a, a real need. You know, So for us, um, obviously with gun violence, uh, homicides, it makes 100% perfect sense that the um, Portland Police Bureau is going to allocate their resources towards the most serious crime, right? Mm -hmm. That's a very rational mm -hmm. thing to do. Uh, but what that leaves us with is looking at those detective resources. Uh, my understanding from talking to the chief, and, and we talk a lot, we, we work together very well, um, is that there is one detective per precinct, which three major precincts in the Portland Police Bureau, that focuses on property crimes. One. So that's three property crime detectives across the Portland Police Bureau. Wow. Um, when you're talking about the increase in stolen cars that we've experienced in our community, the increase in retail and organized retail theft that we're experiencing, um, you know, that's an area where we need those resources. So I think every community has to look at this for themselves and see what their strength is. Um, but yes, I think we need more resources uh, in, in Portland to, to help us uh, do that work so that people can be held accountable. Actually, Alex, I'm sorry, one quick follow-up. Mike, is this a is this a resource allocation problem? Like policymakers are not spent are not directing enough dollars here, or is this a workforce shortage problem where there's not enough law enforcement professionals who are willing to take the jobs in the city of Portland? Well, uh, it's a great question. And and so as the, the county district attorney, I'm not the best expert on yeah. the Portland Police Bureau. And and so I'm not a one of their decision makers. I don't know their budget, uh, you know, intimately or understand those things. Um, I do know that uh, recruitment for law enforcement agencies across the country has been challenging over the past several years. So is, that's got to be a, a piece of the puzzle and sure. in the mix. I know that Portland Police Bureau has been able to recruit. I'm told that they've hired over a hundred new, uh, you know, new officers who will now begin the process of going to DPSST, the academy and starting their eight month, 18 month training process before they're ready to hit the streets. Um, so, you know, I'm sure it's in the mix uh, of issues, both, both of those things. Alex. And then uh, I, I do have one question, but just to lead up to it, as you're kind of explaining the different components of the criminal justice system, 
Uh, whose responsibility is it to ensure that uh, anyone accused of a crime has access to a public de- a public defender? Does that fall under your office, or where does that where does that kind of fall in the system? Great question, Alex. Um, I every once in a while, uh, and I've been talking about the shortage of public defenders and how cases are getting dismissed in our counties. Every week, we put out a press release about the cases being dismissed. So it's an issue that I've been really trying to ring the alarm bells for some time now. Every once in a while, somebody will see me and they'll say, why don't you hire more public defenders? Uh, and, you know, for me as a That's prosecutor. That's what I was just about to ask you. But. <laughs> <laughs> as a prosecutor, like that's such a like it's such a funny idea. Like we're we are on the other side of the ball and you would never want prosecutors and public defenders in the same agency because there's confidentiality. You want people to trust their public defenders. If they're also working for the prosecutor, you know, there's all kinds of issues with that. So they need to be separate and apart from each other. Um, And this is one of the challenging parts about the criminal justice system. You have uh, police uh, agencies, which are typically funded by at the city level. Um, You have sheriff and district attorney resources, which are funded at the county level. You have the Department of Corrections and the defense attorneys, which are funded at the state level. Uh, And so it's you have all these different levels of who's in charge of funding what things within the same community public safety system. So for public defenders, the Office of Public Defense Services is the agency that the legislature funds and gives the money to, and then they enter into contracts with providers in all of the counties. And providers can look different in different communities. Um, In Multnomah County, we have two nonprofit firms. One is called uh, MPD, Metropolitan Public Defenders. One is called MDI, Multnomah Defenders, Inc., two bigger uh, nonprofit firms that only do criminal defense work. And then the third contract is what you call the consortia, uh, which is kind of a a looser grouping of attorneys who also pick up public defense work. Uh, And they, they typically handle a lot of conflict cases that maybe the two big firms are conflict out off of for some reason or another, and they handle other work too, but that's one of the things that the consortia attorneys do. And so, the contract holder for their work is the Oregon Public Defense Services Commission, which then contracts with each of the, the communities across our, our state to provide public defense services. Gotcha. And then uh, you uh, led up to my question. I'm glad to hear that's something you've been talking about is, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I guess just kind of generally, what is going on with the shortage? And I know this isn't actually just an Oregon issue. I've read articles about this happening in Oklahoma, articles about this happening in Georgia. And I believe there was an article either in the O or an OPB. But I mean, some of these folks are having trials dismissed for lack of public public defenders. I mean, they're accused of some fairly serious crimes. But, uh, you know, basically because there's a shortage and, of course, everyone has a constitutional right to a defender, uh, I mean, they essentially just get to, from my understanding, walk away from from that point. Uh, so what, what's what's going on with the system? And is this is this a new problem? And why is this happening? Not just in Oregon, you think, but also across the country. Yeah. So I think there's there's a bunch of things uh, that go into this. And so I'll take kind of across the country first. Um, I think in a lot of places, um, public defenders are underpaid. Um, Law school is incredibly expensive. Uh, And so you come out of law school. Many people do. I did. I think I came out of law school with a combined around two hundred thousand dollars debt between undergrad and law school. Uh, And I graduated in 2008. Um, So, you know, you got younger (laughs) people coming out now. And I was just talking to a, a parent who's sending their child to undergrad. And now that costs like $80,000 a year at schools. Um, so, you know, you got people coming out of schools. And I believe the entry level salary for public defenders in Multnomah County is around $65,000 a year. Um, so when you have the student loans and you have that debt coming out, Um, that's not a lot of money, but then you're a lawyer and you're legally trained. And then if you work as a public defender for one or two years, now you're getting trial experience. Well, law firms love attorneys with trial experience. And so you could from, you know, starting at 60,000, 65,000, whatever it is within a couple of years, you might get an offer at a firm for over a hundred thousand dollars and get a big pay raise. 
but now we've taken you out of the public defense system. Mm-hmm. Uh, around the country, nationally, I think those that's one of the big issues is just uh, salary. Uh, it's a little complicated in Oregon because, like I mentioned, there's different layers of who is doing representation. So not every public defender in Oregon is starting out at $65,000. It has to do with different contracting things, but that's one of the issues that's in the mix. Um, specifically in Oregon, you know, one of the things that I think um, changed was there was a, an assessment done by the uh, Sixth Amendment Center, uh, which was a group, an outside group out of state that came in and kind of looked at our public defense system uh, specifically to advise the state of Oregon on its constitutionality. And they found some things that they were very concerned about uh, in, our, in our funding model. And, and as I understand it, one of the big things that they were concerned about was this idea that a public defender would get paid a certain dollar, a set dollar amount per case. Uh, and what they, the reason they were concerned about that constitutionally is because that economically incentivizes defense attorneys uh, to move through cases as fast as possible. The more you can do, the more you get paid. Well, that incentive is at odds with a person's constitutional right to defense. Um, and so putting attorneys in that position where their own uh, you know, financial uh, incentives are, are at odds with their clients is inherently problematic. And so the Sixth Amendment study said, uh, that that funding model has to be revisited. And what happened is the state of Oregon in our contracting model, and you, should, you all should have a public defender on to explain this because they'd be better at it than I would. Like um, Jessica Campy's head of Oregon Public Defense Services, she'd be good. But as I understand it, um, the funding model kind of switched to a more paying people for their time model, not per mm. case, uh, with the idea that the caseloads for defense attorneys used to be too high because they were doing that other model where they were just trying to burn through as many as possible. Well, when you switch the models immediately overnight, you're going to have a deficit in the amount of attorneys you need to handle the cases. Um, if that makes sense, because now attorneys are going to put more time into each case, which is a good thing. Constitutionally good thing. We want people to have representation and like, let's not fool ourselves. Uh, this is a, you know, a, if you don't spend the money up front, you will spend the money later, right? There's ineffective assistance of counsel. Cases get overturned on appeal. That's bad for victims. That's bad for finality. So uh, scrimping on the front end to save a few dollars, you're going to pay for it later on. So we want good representation. We want them to have caseloads that are reasonable and manageable so that they they can provide good advice. But making that switch to the way that our, our defense system is looking at um, handling the amount of cases they're handling um, immediately meant that the same number of attorneys we had, uh, we needed more of them to handle the cases that maybe weren't getting picked up anymore. You throw that into a pandemic where there are labor, labor shortages across every industry from bus drivers to baristas, there's labor shortages, same thing, public defenders, uh, same thing, prosecutors. Um, and it just kind of was a, a mix where we saw in Oregon specifically uh, the crisis that we're in today of not having enough resources to handle all the cases. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Uh, and then switching gears here just a little bit, and then I think Ben has has one more question. Uh, so just kind of curious on your, uh, I guess, general take on the state of Portland when it comes to uh, to crime. I mean, I think obviously... Uh, I believe last year set a rate for homicide record, if I'm not mistaken, or got pretty close. Uh, there's been a large kind of influx in gun violence. And as you were talking about retail theft and things of that sort, uh, uh, you know, do you see kind of uh, potentially some of this starting to hopefully mellow off or do you think it's potentially going to get worse or uh, just kind of, I guess, curious general, uh, curious of your general thoughts on the future and just where things might be heading? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, again, it's it's important to recognize that we need to restore the feeling of public safety in Multnomah County. Um, you know, people should feel confident. We want people to come uh, to Portland. They, we want businesses. We want people to patronize the businesses, go out to restaurants. We have to restore the sense of public safety. There was some uh, promising data that came out from the FBI from 2022 looking at crime rates. 
where they see that the uh, spike in crime that happened, you know, nationally across the pandemic across cities, they're seeing evidence that that's receding uh, in Multnomah County. Uh, and, and actually in most places across the state of Oregon, there was a couple of exceptions, Washington County and Marion County had some exceptions, but Multnomah County, uh, they saw some of these crime rates start to fall, but that's not translating necessarily into people feeling more safe. Um, so I think I have hope because I'm seeing some of these signs like that. I'm also starting to see every day we move away from the pandemic. I'm seeing more and more people coming downtown, showing, you know, coming into the office for work. Uh, those are all positive things. You know, I think when everybody was working from home, uh, that allows there to be a, a vacuum of, of activity downtown. And when you have a vacuum, you know, some other uh, maybe people that are, not there for the right reasons are gonna fill that space. So I think the more and more people are coming downtown, coming back to work, those things are all positive trajectory. We're seeing our tourism dollars, uh, you know, uh, forecasted to get us back on track to where we've been pre-pandemic. So, I mean, I think there are some good signs. I was talking to a um, uh, the director of Bridges to Change the other day, he told me about 200 new treatment beds that were coming online with the measure 110 money that's is getting out and into the community. Those are resources that we desperately need. So those coming online is, is a positive sign. Um, you know, when I started in this uh, agency as an intern uh, underneath Mike Shrunk in, in 2007, uh, we had around a hundred attorneys in the office, hundred prosecutors. Uh, when I took over for DA Underhill uh, in 2020, we had 72. Uh, and that's not because we had vacancies. Uh, that's because over the years, uh, the labor costs just outstripped the investment in the agency. And so cuts were made year after year after year. Uh, the last couple of years, I'm very uh, proud that we've worked well together with the county commission. They've been making investments into my agency every single year. Uh, we're up to 81 prosecutors as of today. Uh, we're in our budget cycle right now. I expect that number to even go up a little bit further. Uh, so we're building back the agency to where it should be. Uh, we, of course, need more, uh, you know, and so we're going to keep working towards that. But it's a positive sign. We're, we're making investments in places like we have our access attorney program, which is getting prosecutors out into the community. So they're working with uh, community members. They're showing up at community meetings. Uh, they're able to go to schools to, uh, you know, be present so that people can hopefully start to feel that sense of safety. I think a lot of times all you see in the media is this bad thing happened uh, and then, you know, nothing, this person was released or, or whatever happened and you don't get any follow-up. So having prosecutors who are in the community working with people on what they're seeing happening locally to them, Multnomah County is a big county and it is not monolithic. Different areas, different uh, places have different issues and, and things that they have to combat. We have a, a prosecutor in Old Town, very much a, a different th uh, challenge in Old Town than in Hazelwood, where we're seeing a lot of gun violence around uh, young people. But having prosecutors in both of those communities allows them to focus on those issues and report back closely to the people that they're serving. So trying to restore that sense of safety is a big priority for me. And trying to get the word out like we are doing here today on your podcast uh, about some of the truth of what's going on in terms of how many cases we're prosecuting and that we're taking this very seriously. So that's a, a perfect transition to our final question. Uh, I am sure you knew from the moment you won your election that there would be a challenge here <laughs> when you ran again in four years because there are such divergent views of how criminal justice should work. Uh, Vadim Mazursky was floated as a potential candidate early. I think your first challenger officially filed uh, last week, Nathan Vasquez, who works in your office, he was endorsed by the Portland Firefighters Union. Who knows if other people will jump in? I think the question that I want to ask is, I think it's a West Wing quote where they say, um, people think that elections are about competing answers to the same question, but elections are actually about uh, a competition about what question voters should be asking. Like, what, what do you think the question of 2024's election should be? What should the election be about? Well, I think this election is really about restoring that sense of safety to our community. I think that's what people need to hear and, and need to see a vision. You know, when I see the, the 
Betsy Johnson and the people for Portland stuff and the criticisms, there's no solutions there. They're not proposing ideas, right? Uh, they're just taking cheap shots. Um, so I think what voters are really going to want to hear and what I'm proud to talk to them about in my record is what, how are we going to continue to work? Look, we have some real challenges. Uh, you know, automobile theft, that really went up, uh, especially with the, you guys might be familiar with the Hondas and the Kias and how easy they are to steal. If you no, don't know, uh, you don't know, well, go on TikTok uh, and <laughs> you will learn, you'll learn how to steal a Kia or a Honda. I did a ride along with the police and they showed, they're like, Hey DA, this is how you steal one of these. And I was like, wow. Okay. It really is as easy as they say it is. Um, so that's a contributing factor, but you know, we have to, we have to rise to the occasion on these challenges. So standing up an auto theft task force, I think uh, rises to the challenge of taking that seriously. We just uh, went uh, with police officers and, and serve warrants on a chop shop. And that's how we're going to get at this issue. Uh, we're going to look at who are the folks driving a lot of the things that we're seeing in our community. It's a small percentage of people that do a lot, a big percentage of the crime. We're going to focus our resources there, shutting down chop shops, organized retail theft. We're going to go after the places where people are selling the things uh, because that's what's incentivizing the people to go into stores and rip, rip things off the shelves. So looking at those issues, you know, from, uh, you know, trying to, to intercede in that behavior, hold people accountable for that. You know, people might say, oh, well, that doesn't sound maybe necessarily like the progressive uh, candidate who ran in 2020, but it absolutely is because it's still about community safety and holding people accountable. And then we can talk about what do we do? How do we get to a place where that person is not going to be stealing uh, and doing those things again? And a lot of folks that we're seeing are dealing with serious acute addiction, especially with some of the hard drugs like fentanyl. Uh, we need to get people into treatment. We need more treatment resources to come online because that's the only way we're going to break some of these cycles of, of the crime that's happening in our community. But I think what this, the, the question for this election is, you know, what is the vision? And, you know, when I got elected with 76% of the vote, like you yeah. said, there are people of two minds of this, but Multnomah County was really of one mind in this election. I mean, as far as the contested election goes, that's almost as unanimous as you can get. Uh, and so people really wanted reform. And now I think people really want to have that sense of safety restored. I think what I see is that those two things are not mutually exclusive. In fact, those two things are directly related to each other. Because how do we restore that sense of safety? You have, you're not going to have a sense of safety if you don't have a trust. It starts with trusting the system, trusting the police, trusting prosecutors to do the right things. And so working on the things that we can do better, still doing the reform, you know, getting our attorneys out into the community, uh, do, uh, you know, correcting wrongful convictions, um, you know, working on alternatives to incarceration that are safe and make sense, like we're doing with our step court which has been going for a year and a half and over 60 participants and only three arrests in that year and a half, that's a recidivism rate of like five or 6% or something like that. Like smart interventions that work, uh, those two things go hand in hand with building trust in the community, legitimacy. When you have trust and legitimacy, you're gonna see that sense of safety restored. So I think that's the vision for Multnomah County. I see the I see the things getting started, the work that we've started since I've been the district attorney, the kind of the green shoots are springing up, not only in public safety, and we got challenges. We got to solve this public defense crisis that has to end. We have to have representation for people. It's not okay for people to walk away and victims not to get accountability because a public defense, a uh, public defender is not appointed. We have real challenges, but I see that people are committed and we're working at all levels. We're working city, county, state, and with the federal government, uh, collaborating at a high level. And I think I see things turning the corner. Awesome. Mike, you've been really generous with your time. So thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Um, if people want to learn more about you or support your campaign, what's the best way for them to learn more or get in touch? Yeah, Mike Schmidt for DA.com. Um, and we're on all the social media so people can check us out there. Uh, and if you have questions about the office, we have data dashboards. We're one of the most transparent district attorney's office in the country in terms of our data. We have like, I think, 71 or something public facing dashboards. So if you're kind of a data nerd like I am, you like that stuff, 
uh, go onto our website, mcda.us, and check out the data for yourself so you can see the different things that we're measuring and how we're looking at uh, making Multnomah County safer. Awesome. District Attorney Mike Schmidt, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, and uh, listeners, we'll see you back here next week. Thanks, gentlemen.